right then, moving on, we're now in part three on Michael Landon. If you want to follow along, you can go to creationliberty.com, type in the word Landon, L-A-N-D-O-N, and that should get you to the article. Or, or if you're listening by YouTube, you can click the link in the description, and that should take you roughly to where we are. You'll have to, it'll take you to the article, that is, but you'll have to scroll down to join us. So last week we got done talking about the basic premise of a lot of this is we want to, or excuse me, Michael Landon wants to teach that, well, you know, just laugh and enjoy life and and those types of things. We're going to see statements from him like that later when I've read in the Bible many times, especially Ecclesiastes chapter 7, explains it very clearly that sorrow is better than laughter. You don't see people getting saved in a comedy club, okay? And you're not going to hear Benny Hill music in the background when somebody is trying to give the gospel message. And for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And that's called repentance, grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing, folks. And if you want to learn more about that, again, go to creationliberty.com, type in the word repent, R-E-P-E-N-T, and that'll get you to an article called, Is Repentance Part of Salvation? It's an incredibly important teaching. Please go in and read that and understand it. So Michael Landon also produced a show called Highway to Heaven, in which he plays the lead role of an angel who travels around and does you know, good deeds for people, is what he calls it. Now, he claims in the show, Jonathan, remember the, this is, excuse me, let me preface that. Michael Landon plays the role of Jonathan in the show, Jonathan the Angel. And and by the way, when I watched this, when I first turned this on, because I had to go borrow this from somebody, I found somebody who had a copy of it, and I went and borrowed it so I could sit down with it go through a few of these episodes and expose it. And once again, I am not encouraging people to go get this stuff and start watching it. I'm telling you about this so you'll sanctify yourself from it. That's the whole purpose of this, is to warn Christians about the leaven and the false doctrine in this stuff so that we will stop looking at this stuff and and, and definitely stop claiming that it is supposedly, in quotations, Christian when it's not. But even in the first episode when I looked at this, they didn't really spell this out clearly. And I'll show you later. I mean, I had eventually go do research to try to figure out what is that, what is actually going on here? What is the, the, the premise of this entire story? Because it's almost as if they started this whole thing up and it was assumed that everybody was supposed to just presume what the premise of it was. So Michael Landon plays Jonathan. Jonathan claims that God, who he calls the boss, has sent him to help people. And like I said, I had I had some memory of this show from when I was a child, but I didn't remember anything specific about it. That's why I had to find a copy of it and research this topic. So Highway to Heaven, of course, everybody says this is, you know, most people say this is Christian. It's the kind of things they'll show on these I guess if you want to call them so-called Christian networks like TBN and places like that, I'm telling you, if you want to go hear a lot of false preachers and you want to hear a lot of leaven and a lot of wickedness, go turn on TBN. You'll find plenty of it. In fact, it'll be far more deceptive. Wicked, like cable channels that have fornication and adultery and cursing and just... uh, Un- murder and theft and all sorts of wickedness on them, like HBO, for example, I believe that TBN is far more deceptive than HBO. I mean, that's w- even us having to say that should be somewhat embarrassing for churchgoers. Because the fact that they can't, they say, oh, HBO is bad, but TBN is good, is showing that they have no discernment whatsoever. HBO is easy to tell. You can see all this. They put their sin right up front. But at the same time, if you go to, you know, like TBN, you can't see that as clearly. And it only shows their blindness, or I would say their willing blindness at such things. But anyway, getting back to Highway to Heaven, it's got this, let's tug at your heartstrings style of writing, okay? And remember, that's how the devil lures you in is they're, they're going to tug at your emotions to lure you into this and then start teaching you a bunch of false unbiblical practices and unbiblical doctrines. 
And it's, I mean, the Highway to Heaven is very similar to how Little House on the Prairie was written, although Highway to Heaven is much more ridiculous, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So in the first episode, season one, that's entitled Highway to Heaven, Jonathan Smith, who is the angel, travels to a retirement home to be a maintenance worker for the building. Now, the Bible clearly teaches us, it's very apparent, that God's angels are his servants. Specifically, they're meant to deliver messages, as well as they're there for combat and defense against devils of this world. But they're specifically for delivering his messages. God communicates to us through them, because the Bible tells us that no man has seen God at any time, and that's from John 1.18. But you can see examples of the, the angels being messengers in the Bible repeatedly. If you go to Luke chapter 1, it's in there, Zechariah chapter 1, Mark chapter 16. The angels are there delivering messages. Now, the Bible directly teaches that God cannot lie. That's in Titus 1.2 which I'll quote to you, in, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God can't lie. Meaning that if his angels come and deliver a message that is not true, then that, whatever you're seeing, is not of, not of God. It's not of Christ. It's not an angel of God. The angel of God will never lie because God cannot lie. So if you, if, I mean, people said, I saw an angel and he told me this and it's a lie against scripture, then that was a devil that they saw. And don't misunderstand, as we've read many times before, the scriptures about where Satan can transform himself into an angel of light and that his ministers, meaning that his devils, can also transform themselves to appear as ministers of righteousness. So... The, what's the, why am I prefacing all this? Well, the problem is is that the angel Jonathan in Highway to Heaven starts lying within the first few minutes of the show. Flat out. Now, if again, uh, well, let me just preface with this. John eight forty four, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So whatever is coming to you, if you see this vision that's coming to you with a particular message, and it is a lie that is in the message, then you need to pray that the Lord God would have the angels to protect you from those devils. And I'm just saying that, I'm not saying that Christians even have that stuff happen to them, okay, in particular. I'm not saying it couldn't, but you understand that when, when lies are being spoken that are against the word of God, then... I mean, as the angel said in Jude, when Michael the archangel, he said, the, the Lord rebuke thee. And that's the response that we can give to that stuff. I think it was talking about there was no railing accusations coming from it. Where they, you know, It's the kind of preachers that you've heard. They said, well, these devils got no power. There's these stupid, dumb devils, and they're stupid, and they're garbage. And, you know, they, what they start doing is start railing against it. That's not, that's not how we deal with that. Okay, we go to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him deal with the matter. So anyway, let's, let's give some examples here. Jonathan walks into a retirement home office to meet a disgruntled owner who is already talking about, you know, he comes in, this guy's on the phone, he's talking about evicting some older folks over lack of payment. Now, by the way, let me, let me, I realize that in the show they portrayed as this mean guy. He says, you better get this payment or I'm kicking him out of here. And so he does it all mean like, which that kind of thing you don't typically see today. They don't act like that. But at the same time, the property owner's not wrong in saying, I'm going to have to evict your parent or grandparent if this payment is not made. Why? Because if he doesn't get the payment, he can't pay for the business. And then everybody gets evicted. If he, can't, if he cannot maintain the property, which, by the way, we're going to see was a big problem, they couldn't afford to upkeep the property because people were not paying what they were supposed to be paying in the first place. And they make this in the show sound like this is something evil. This is not evil. If you can't afford it, then it doesn't exist. You can't upkeep it. Nobody can live there. So if he's telling them, I've got to evict you because payment is not coming in, that is simply, I mean, what about what the guy was doing was unbiblical? 
You're like, well, he wasn't being charitable. Charitable with what? What do you have to be charitable with? If they're not going to pay what they owe, it's not a matter of being charitable because if he had all the, I mean, look, just bringing everybody in, I mean, you look at these nursing homes out here, how are you paying a staff? How are you paying for the building itself? How are you paying for food and for, for everything that's got to be done in this place? Somebody's got to pay for that. And either the community comes together and does it, or individuals have to pay for it, as I said, indi- as it applies, individually. So, I mean, it just, that itself, when I stopped and thought about it, I said, I can see how, because a lot of times I had to pause in this and think, because the way the show will portray it, they'll make these guys look like they're bad, but it's amazing to me that the the guy who was the manager of the building was actually speaking more sense than almost anybody else in the show. And he was the one who was painted as the bad guy. So Jonathan, it's Jonathan Smith is his name. He walks in to ask about this job as being a maintenance worker, okay? Which the manager of the building said, he said, well, that wasn't supposed to be published in the newspaper until tomorrow. So he says, how did you know about that? So to quell any suspicions, Jonathan says, I found out about it at the newspaper office. Lie. That's an absolute lie. Because at the beginning of the episode, he hitched a ride into town. He never went to the newspaper office, and they never told him about that. So he lied. But it's like when you watch the show, you don't even think about it. Because of how they're portraying him and how they're portraying everyone else around him, you're thinking more about that and not even considering that he just lied out of his mouth and then claimed he was he was sent from God. I mean, this is already a clear heresy to Scripture, and we've barely even gotten a couple minutes into the show. So a couple minutes after that, after that scene, Jonathan lies again. The secretary of the building showed him around, but never gave him her name. Yet he knew that her name was Leslie. Now, when she asked him, she goes, I never gave you my name. How did you know my name? He lied. He said, oh, well, the owner told me when you weren't in the room. That never happened. You can see it in the show. That never happened. He lied to her. Then Jonathan plants a bunch of new flowers around the edges of the building. And the following day, they're fully grown and blooming. Now, Leslie asks, how is that possible? Jonathan lies again. He says, well, it must have been this chemical that I mixed into them. It must have been that new chemical. He didn't mix any chemical into those. But when she asked what the chemical was, he goes, eh, I don't remember. So he lies again. He lied about doing it and then lied about the knowledge of him doing it. I mean, it's lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. And these are just, I mean, I'm just giving you a few examples. This show, lies are nonstop. He lies to people all the time in every episode about who he is, about what he's done, about where he's been, about who he knows, about what he knows. And in the end, what it's doing is communicating to the, to the viewing audience, is communicating to you, a born again in Christ, that, hey, it's okay to lie as long as it's for a good reason or a reason that you particularly think is good. Again, I encourage people to go to our website, creationliberty.com, type in the word lies, L-I-E-S, into the search bar, and you'll find an article called God Does Not Justify Lies. In that... I explained throughout all the scripture, lies are never justified. And I've had people brought to me, what about Rahab? I explained that in there. Rahab, if you'll read the scripture carefully, Rahab was never justified for her lies. Rahab was justified because of her faith, not because of her lies. And so lies are never, I mean, God, even in Proverbs chapter 6, he spells it out twice. He, he says, these six things doth the Lord hate. And then he says, well, seven are an abomination unto me because he had to add in lies two times in there. It normally would have been a list of six, but he put lies twice in there and made it a list of seven. So I'm not saying that no one may ever meet an angel and be unaware of it. Don't misunderstand. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 2, it says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And that's even what happened to Lot. 
when the two angels visited the town. I'm not even sure. It doesn't indicate in the Bible anywhere that Lot knew they were angels, but they were strangers that he brought into his home to protect and, and to care for. And so as it says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, that was a doctrine that was taught to him even back then. However, angels don't go around lying and preaching false messages that contradict the word of God. It's only devils that do that. And I guess I'll read you the verses again. I know I just mentioned them a minute ago, but I'll read you the verses. From 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, as a side note, I also want to include this, and we're going to get back to this later, you know, in the teaching. I think I may split this into, this will be part three, and we'll probably do a part four next week. I don't want to rush this, because I, I hate it when I get rushed on a teaching. I always feel like I lift, leave out a bunch of things if I feel like I need to rush just to finish it one week, so we're probably going to split this into two, a couple more parts here. But Michael Landon's daughter, Cheryl, in her book that I referred to earlier called I Promised My Dad, an Intimate Portrait of Michael Landon by His Eldest Daughter, okay, when she gives her testimony about Michael Landon, she talks about his insistence that all his children tell the truth no matter what. And this is from her book. It says, quote, I can recall two things that Dad asked of his children. He wanted us to be, first of all, honest, and secondly, assertive. Don't ever lie to me, Dad said. I always want to hear the truth, no matter what. End quote. Now, it's amazing to me, because when I read through her book, Cheryl tries to defend Michael Landon as being a great father. But he was a total hypocrite. He would teach his children to never lie, and then write TV shows in which the character he played lied all the time. I mean, and, and not, that's, that's not even the worst of it. The worst of it is that Jonathan Smith was claimed to be sent by the holy living God to do so, to lie. And Cheryl, in her book, later admitted that, quote, the man who demanded honesty from others was dealing in deceit, end quote. But sadly, even though the evidence was staring her in the face that her father was a wicked man, she would never come to admit it. And folks, we'll get back to that quote, because I'm going to be quoting that again later in this teaching. We'll show you more details of what exactly she's talking about when we, when we go into more details about the choices that Michael Landon made in his life and the deceitful things that he did. Now, later in this episode, Jonathan goes to a bar to keep an eye on his co-worker's brother, Mark Gordon, an ex-cop who has a drinking problem. Now, Mark Gordon is played by Victor French. Victor French played in a lot of the shows that Michael Landon was in. Uh, he was in Little House on the Prairie. He played Mr. Edwards in Little House on the Prairie, if you know who I'm talking about there. And a lot of that is Michael Landon was helping this guy paint a new picture in Hollywood than he had, meaning that the public in general viewed him very poorly. Do you remember earlier when I talked about how the different bad people in movies and stuff, when, when people see them in real life, they'll treat them terribly? Even though it's uh, it's just for entertainment, it's all fiction, they'll say that all the time, but yet they'll treat the actors in that very way. Well, that's what they were doing with Victor French because he used to play murderers and rapists and things like that. And so he was joining in with Michael Landon in these shows to try to paint him a better picture on, on the big screen. So Mark, Victor French is playing Mark the ex-cop. He gets into a fight in a back alley. And, or rather, he just starts taking a beating without fighting back. Jonathan steps in to help him, and Jonathan gets punched across one cheek, and he doesn't take any damage, right? After all, he's invulnerable somehow. And he takes the punch, it doesn't hurt him at all, and then the guy punches him across his other cheek without taking any damage, and says, then he, he responds to him, I turned the other cheek, right before beating the guy senseless. Now, of course, most churchgoers who are going to be watching such a show, they know what Jonathan is referring to there, which is from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, in, starting in verse 39, says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Okay, so what he's saying here, and you need to understand, okay, that many churchgoers have misinterpreted these verses. They don't understand what they mean. They don't understand the context of what he's talking about. Especially when you come to the issue of self-defense or defense of another person in a time of need. They think, well, you shouldn't do that. Whatever evil that comes on, Jesus Christ don't, said, don't resist any evil, just let them do it. Okay, so, you know, men out there, when the thief breaks into your house to rape your wife and your daughter, you should just let them do it, you know, because after all, you don't resist evil, right? That is not at all what Jesus Christ was teaching here. Those types of people are more well known as pacifists, and they believe that if like a thief breaks into your home, you should just let him, you know, suffer whatever evil he brings into your house. But even Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 43, but know this, that if the good man of the house, the good man of the house, had known and watched, the thief would come, he would have watched, and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. Now, of course, that's it's, he's talking about that in a particular context, but he's giving a metaphorical reference to this particular instance, which is true, that a good man of the house is not going to suffer a thief to break up his house. And if you want to learn more about that, we have a short article called Can Christians Kill in Self-Defense? Just type in the word defense, D-E-F-E-N-S-E, into the search bar at creationliberty.com, defense, and that should get you to that article. You can find more uh, fear, find more stuff about that. In fact, you probably could just type in the word self, S E L F if that makes makes things a little easier for you. But that'll explain more details about that kind of stuff. Now, most people again, they don't understand what Matthew 5 is talking about. Jesus was explaining to the Jews a different way of thinking than they had been traditionally brought up with. Namely, they were brought up with an eye for an eye or and a tooth for a tooth, which is from Exodus chapter 21. In verse 24, that says, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Which means, if a man did a criminal act against another man, in which, in the struggle and the scurry of the matter, the man who was attacked lost his eyeball. Well then, the punishment that would come from the court, if they captured the man who did the wrong, he would lose his eye. They would cut out his eye the same. And so that was a governmental law to help prevent crime. And that is interesting simply because if our government were doing similar things today, it would prevent it would typically prevent a lot more crime. Instead of somebody beat up this person and you know did them some damage, some you know broke some bones and did some permanent damage or something like that, the person what they go to jail, here, we'll throw them in jail for six months. And then when they get out, everything's better. It's not better. The person who suffered all the damage, they didn't get any restitution. Or a lot of times don't. Thieves nowadays, they just, well, let's throw them in jail. Let's make all the taxpayers pay for their, their plumbing, their electricity, their housing, their food, and everything else. And that'll show them. Yeah, I'm not saying jail's a cakewalk, don't misunderstand. But in the Bible, if... Like, for example, some, okay, here's how the situation would be handled, let's say, our, our modern-day society. A store, let's say an electronic store, which <laughs> electronic stores almost don't exist anymore. You've got the big mega stores. Let's say an individual mom-and-pop electronic store, somebody broke in and stole big-screen TV. It was worth, like, $1,000, right? They stole it. Well, you see, what the mom-and-pop store has to do is continually pay for insurance to have the insurance replace that stuff. So they have to keep continually keep forking out money to get the stuff back. And then that person goes to jail. Well, what restitution did the mom-and-pop store actually get for that? Nothing. They have to keep forking out money for this over and over. But in the Bible, what would happen? Well, they would steal that $1,000 TV... The Bible says that the thief is supposed to pay back four to five times what he stole. So that means the thief would be put to work by the government and made to pay back that, to that mom and pop store four to five thousand dollars for the thousand dollar TV. 
So which one's actual justice? And so that's where I, I try to give those examples to get people to think about things. I'm not saying that Christians, folks, Christians have no business enacting any punishment for crimes whatsoever. None. We have no justification for that. We have no commandment for that. In fact, the Bible says that we, we do not use the carnal weapons of this world. The things after the flesh, we don't do that. What we do is we preach the word unto people. We give them the truth of God's word. And that's what we fight against are principalities and powers. We fight against the rulers of darkness of this world through the word of God. And that's the pulling down of strongholds. Not that we go out and do any of the things of punishment for crime that was given to the, to the Israeli government in the Old Testament. That's a whole different matter. But what they were teaching, what they were doing in that society was an eye for an eye, a tooth for tooth. Which does make sense. However... Because Christ was starting the Church of the New Testament dispensation and the gospel was going out to the Gentile nations, things were supposed to operate a little bit differently. Okay? And we were talking about that in, in just our first half. We just went over that in Hebrews chapter 7 that there was, when, when there was a change in the priesthood, there was a, made also a necessity a change of the law, it says in Hebrews chapter 7. So when we go from the priesthood of the Levites to Melchizedek, which is Jesus Christ, if you read through Hebrews, it explains more about that. But when we change from one to the other, then there's also made as of necessity a change in the law as well. So things, because there's certain things fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyway, what they don't understand is that Jesus was trying to teach us a different way of thinking. Is not to say, well, they did wrong to me, so I'm going to, going to do wrong to them. And the problem with this was not the punishment of an eye for an eye. That was not the problem. The problem is that the people started to use that as an excuse for revenge. You see, they always wanted to get revenge on whoever. And, and it's, it's a matter of, because the Bible says that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And that's in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 17. It says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If it's possible, let's live peaceably with them. Now, if we can't, and we have to bring the government into it, okay, then we have to. But if you can live peaceably, let's do it. Lorraine and I have had men steal money from us. We've had thieves come after us and stole money from us. Yeah, we were angry when it happened, but we had to let it go. We let it go and move on and not hold that against them. And part of it is once I get past the anger, I'm afraid for that man because he's not come to repentance and he's going to have to face judgment. I don't want that for him. I want him to repent, to come to grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing and repentance and be born again. Anyway, it continues to say, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I, w I will repay, saith the Lord. So God is going to repay them. They will get what's coming to them because the Bible says God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Everyone is going to get what's coming to them. The only people in this world that will not get what's coming to them are those who have been born again in Christ because we've been given mercy. We don't deserve mercy, but we've been given that. So again, like I said, it's not always possible to live peaceably with all men. Some men are troublemakers, and they do wicked deeds. But what this Highway to Heaven TV show is teaching people is that a man has to hit you twice before you beat him up. I mean, that's not even close to what Christ was teaching in those verses. And they thought they were being real cute in that show to use that phrase. But that had nothing to do with, what was, what, with that situation at all. Not to mention, a real angel of God... Let's talk real angels. They not only could have stopped the fighting by their very presence. They're, they wouldn't have had to do anything but even just, but just show their presence and it would have stopped the fighting. Because what happened in the Bible when an angel would appear? A man would fall on his face on the ground in fear. And so a real angel would have no need to involve himself in a physical scuffle with ordinary men. Angels help protect us and give us messages on, on our behalf for 
the for the Christian God of the Bible, for our Heavenly Father, but they don't have a need to try to... These petty issues and these petty scuffles with men, why would they have to get involved? They don't need to. Now, many events take place during this episode, which, but I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail about them. Folks, I could have written a long time on this show about all the false things and all the implications they even make about certain things, and I'm just, there's no need. I just want to show you the basics here. But what Jonathan is attempting to do is to get people in this show, okay? He, he comes in with this message of, well, you can just have fun, laugh, and enjoy your life, because that's what God really wants for you. That's what he's teaching these people in this episode, and in many of the episodes. But that's not what the Bible teaches, and it's not what God's angel messengers came to tell mankind. In James 4, 9, it says, Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. See, that's how people come to repentance. And again, repentance is grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing. And that the repentance article that I referred to, referred you to earlier on our website is Repentance Part of Salvation. I just did a full renovation of that. And what I, I mean, what I had done previously is I had written that in a response to a, a, a couple of emails I had received. But when I went back and looked at it, I said, I haven't, I didn't really do a full teaching on it. I really did more of a response to emails and a response to false preachers. So I went back and I did a full length teaching on it. I've revised it now. And I'm much happier with that. And I think, in my personal opinion, that is the most important teaching I am ever going to give. So if you won't listen to anything else, at least go look at that. But if we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 again, as we did earlier, Ecclesiastes 7, 6 says, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of, a, of the fool. This is also vanity. Which a lot of people skip past this when they don't understand what it's saying. As the crackling of thorns under a pot, what it's talking about is when a pot is has a fire underneath it. Okay, they're boiling water or cooking something, and you throw in whatever into the fire. Okay, that's what it's referring to here. When you when you have thorns like that. Now we've done that out here when we've had fires out here because we we live basically in the woods. And so we have a lot of stuff like that when we burn those things. When you throw a thorn or something into a fire, it'll make like a popping sound or a little crackle and it'll fizzle out. But most of the time it's just like a pop and then it never, and then it's gone. It says, so is the laughter of the fool. What the Bible's explaining, it's a loud sound that ends quickly and it's in total vanity. And like I said, I'm not saying that laughter's wrong. Don't misunderstand. I'm saying that people don't get saved in a comedy club. I mean, basically what these people of the laughter, they rise up to play. Their entire focus of their day, even when, you know, they're doing all their work, their focus is, let me get home and do all these things that are going to make me laugh and make me feel good and, and all that. That's their, that's their entire focus. They rise to play while men are suffering, dying, and ending up in hell through deception and false doctrine. I, and again, folks, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying it's wrong to play. I'm not saying it's wrong to laugh or to have fun or to enjoy the fruits of your labor. In fact, Ecclesiastes says that particularly, that it's good for you to enjoy the fruits of your labor. But what this TV show is attempting to get people to believe is that all God really wants is for people to laugh, play, and love their lives. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. John 12:25 says, He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. The Bible teaches a different doctrine than what they're teaching. The Bible is calling to people to grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing. And to be born again so they can be converted. So ex-cop Mark then confronts Jonathan in his home. Where Jonathan tells him that he's an angel. Jonathan then proceeds to tell him he's not the best angel because he makes mistakes and that God wants to teach him how to be a good angel through his mistakes. There is absolutely nothing biblical about this. They're using the term God, they're using the term angel, but what the Bible says 
about God and angels. And what Landon says about God and angels are complete contradictions. So ex-cop Mark's suspicions of Jonathan Grow after he, he claims he's an angel. And that would be obvious to anyone. If somebody came along, I'm an angel, uh, suspicions are going to grow of that person. So Jonathan pleads with him not to go to the police. And he says, quote, I'll be gone by the time you get back, and I won't have finished my job. You're going to hurt a whole bunch of innocent people for no reason, and all because you don't trust your fellow man. There's an awful lot of good people in this world, Mark. I'm just here to try to help them, end quote. Now, any of you who are a regular student of Christ's doctrine will know that this supposed angel is actually a devil in disguise because he's teaching the opposite of what the Bible teaches. First of all, he's teaching, oh, there's an awful lot of good people in this world. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are, all, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Jonathan is teaching Mark and the viewing audience to just trust your fellow man. He says, well, you're not trusting your fellow man, Mark. That's what you're supposed to do. The Bible tells us to put our trust in the Lord. In Psalm 56, 11, it says, I, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do to, unto me. 2 Samuel 22, 3, The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. And the violence described by Samuel was that which was coming from mankind. The Bible does not teach us to put our trust in men, because mankind cannot be trusted in their unclean spirits. They can only be trusted if they have their spirits cleansed by the blood of the, of the Lamb of God, and only then because they trust in the Lord. They themselves can't be trusted because, we, folks, we're still in the flesh. Until the flesh is gone and the, only the spirit remaining... We can't be trusted, not fully, but the way we trust in one another is that we put our trust in the Lord God, and if we are all putting our trust in the Lord God, that's how we can trust one another, but outside of that, we can't really trust mankind. Hosea 10.13 says, Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou distrust in thy way, and the multitude of thy mighty men. 2 Corinthians 1, nine. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Jeremiah 17.5 Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. So the Bible is, I mean, what, what Jonathan Smith teaches in Highway to Heaven and what the Bible teaches are clear polar opposites. We should understand that by now. So I want to give a summary of what's actually happening in this episode. Just for all of you listening so you understand how, because what I'm about to describe, how stupid this really gets. I have no other way to describe that this is flat out stupid. Now, the old folks hate the retirement home they're in, right? They go into this place and it's a bunch of people that are just sitting around, like, drooling into their chairs and doing nothing. And it's like complete silence and all that. And I'm thinking, well, it's not exactly like that. It's close. That was kind of realistic. But normally what they do is they'd have a TV playing in there at all times. Because you have to keep brainwashing the people. And they, and they never show that these people are totally hyped up on drugs. Because those are the facts. Now, myself and a couple of the other people in our church, we have worked as CNAs, right? Or, or done that type of work, in-home care like that for the elderly. And I've worked in retirement homes, folks. I have worked in these, these different nursing homes. And I'm telling you, they do not portray in that show the reality of what's actually going on. Because a lot of that, I mean, they never show that these people are so drug-induced, you can't even hardly have a conversation with them. It's almost impossible. And a lot of times, that's why they do it. These nursing homes are a place that they send 
that these children or grandchildren will send their parents and grandparents to die. They will send them in there to kind of push them out of the way so they can die and they don't really have to deal with them. A lot of times these children, I mean, they don't take any of the, I mean, their family doesn't sit down and say, okay, we're going to bring them to our home and care for them. What they do, you know, like what the Bible says to honor your father and mother. And to honor means in, in relation to those verses, it means not only to give them the respect and honor that they would deserve as your parents, but also to, to do good unto them in their old age, which there's New Testament scripture I could give for that as well. But the problem is, is what a lot of them do is these families, they go, they're, they're in debt up to their ears with their houses, with their cars, with everything else, and they get into even more debt by throwing money into putting their parents or grandparents in these nursing homes. And then in the nursing homes, folks, I'm not saying that there's not any kind of nurse in these nursing homes that really cares about people. I, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But in the end, I've worked in these places. And those of you who've worked in them, you know what I'm talking about. You become to, you get to a point that you see people come in and leave and when I mean leave, I mean they die. So they come in, they die. 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 And and what? it's the same thing as... Because I've worked in a funeral home as well. Same thing. You actually start getting just desensitized to the whole thing. And, and it's... Whereas you can see people in tears and you can see people grieving and stuff like that, you start to get desensitized to all, to all of it because you just see it so often. And the whole, the, by the, when they get desensitized like that, folks, I have seen it. I am not saying that these people, like these nurses and all that that work in these homes, do not care at all. But when I watch the way that they treat certain things and do certain people, they're in there just doing a job. That's it. They don't really care like you would care if you had your parents in your own home. You would care for them much differently than any nurse is going to do it. And yet you're paying the nurse. So what's happening is that these families and these homes live so lavishly, they get in all sorts of debt, and then both mom and dad have to work, the children are in school, everybody's gone, there's nobody there to take care of them, so they get in more debt by throwing them in a nursing home. And really what they do, they get treated like when they're thrown into these places. These are basically kennels, which you throw a dog into it, and the dog starts yapping, 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 and you don't want to hear them anymore, so you pump them full of tranquilizer to get them shut up and wait for them to die. Those of you who have been in those, am I wrong? Because that's exactly what they do. And I have literally watched people decay from being able to have a conversation with them to them drooling into their pillows, watching them getting drugged to death. I've had to watch it happen. That's the reality of a lot of retirement areas, okay? Now, I'm not saying retirement homes are the exact same thing, but they have nursing home wards in these retirement homes, too. You can't tell me they don't. I've seen them. I've worked in them. So those of you who have actually done the job will know there's a far cry difference from what they're showing in this show and what actually takes place, okay? So anyway, what happens in the show, though, these old folks, they're just, oh, they're just waiting to die. They're sitting there bored and everything like that. And then two days, I'm not kidding, in the show, two days pass. And now they're up partying and saying, we love this place more than anything, and they're willing to lay down their lives for it. What? So they find out the place is being sold by a property owner and they don't want now they don't want to leave. 2 days ago they hated this place and couldn't wait to leave and now they don't want to leave. I Anyway, let's move on. Jonathan goes and visits the owner of the property and the owner demands $116,000, which is too expensive for any of them to purchase. Nobody's got that money. Now in the show, and I'm not kidding, this actually happens, Jonathan has already demonstrated his ability to produce out of nowhere, produce out of nothing, bicycles, flowers, raw steaks, dishes, and sour cream. It all happens in the first episode, I'm not kidding. He produces them out of thin air. But according to Jonathan in the show, it would, quote, anger God, end quote, if he produced $116,000 in cash. Why? Tell, okay, I can produce 
a, a freshly prepared steak from my refrigerator on a plate, which he does during the show. But it would anger God to produce $20 to purchase it. Why? There is zero reason given for that. After all, you just have to... Because the show needs rules, right? Because if an angel gets to do whatever he wants, well, then why can't he produce this money and just solve the problem? Well, he has to give somebody an excuse or a reason. They have to set up rules for the show, okay? It doesn't make any sense. So his new friend, Mark, who now believes... All right, suddenly in the episode, he believes he's an angel now. He convinces Jonathan to have the old folks pool together their monthly retirement checks, right? This is their retirement pool it together, and bet it at the horse track, and have Jonathan pick the winning horse for them. I'm not kidding, this is what they do. Jonathan reluctantly agrees to this. They put all these elderly residents who, now at the beginning of the episode, these people were struggling with their walkers to walk down a hallway, and they put them in the back of a pickup truck and drive them to the horse track, I kid you not. I've got a screenshot image on the website you can go look at if you don't believe me. Like I said, I didn't want to actually put... I, I would have put the clips in here, but I didn't want to get into this debate with... I think it's like NBC or something like that. I don't want to cross their copyright stuff. So because Jonathan's so-called God that he serves, it's not the Christian God of the Bible, apparently approves of gambling for money... A miracle in, ensures that the elderly residents get the money that they need to buy the building. And Mark is so impressed, he decides he wants to travel with John, Jonathan and go around and help people, I would put in quotations, by driving him places. Because after all, angels need cars. Oh, there's that sarcasm again. Sorry, it just it frustrates me that people are right to say, you, You're sarcastic. I'm trying to make a point. This is so stupid. Nothing of this has anything to do with the Word of God. I'm not saying if you didn't know about the differences between the Word of God and the show that you were blinded to this previously. I'm not, I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm saying the show is stupid. I'm saying the fact that he put this on television and called it Christian, that is stupid. And that Christians, we ought to sanctify ourselves. I'm doing this for education, okay? Sometimes sarcasm like that will pop out of my mouth. I'm sorry about that. If you want to call me prideful of that, okay, you can go ahead and do that. And then what I would encourage you guys to do, if you think I'm prideful because of that, then what I encourage you to do is go start up your own ministry. You start providing teachings, and then you show us all the correct way to do it. Show us a better example than I'm doing. I'm not saying that being sarcastic. I'm saying that as a challenge for you to get up and do it better. If you can set a better example than I'm setting, praise God for that. That's wonderful. It will give us another ministry, another preacher to listen to who's preaching truth and righteousness. But when I say that to people, you know what they typically do? They just get angry at me. Because they don't really want to do the work. They're happy to critique it, but they don't want to do it themselves. So, anyway, I guess it's what you call the, uh, what do I call it? The, the, you missed a spot Christians and the shake and bait Christians. I named them those things, and we have an article called The Christian Work Ethic. If you type in the word work, W-O-R-K, into the search bar, creationliberty.com, I talk about those types of people. Boy, when I first shared that, I had a whole lot of people angry at me. I don't like it, did you call that term shake and bake Christian? Oh, is that because you are one? <laughs> they don't like the term. I mean, it's amazing, because the people in our church who are really hard workers, they laughed and they said, that's perfect! But the people who weren't very hard workers, they got really uncomfortable with it. Hmm. That's interesting. It's almost like when Jesus Christ called the Pharisees and Sadducees, chief priests and elders, and all these high up, high end pastors and scribes and all this, he called them whited sepulchers. Everyone else was like, Wow, he is so wise. And they were all like, I can't believe I hate him. He's not a he's not of God. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? So anyway. Moving on, let's move on to this other episode. Episode 3 of Season 1, okay? The false doctrine gets worse. Because I began to notice this when there's a young boy in this episode. Now, he's dying. And he asked Jonathan if he was ever afraid of dying. Have you ever been a time in your life when you were afraid of dying? Jonathan replies, quote, I was once, end quote. 
And as soon as he said that, I stopped the show and I said, Are you... Please don't tell me that they are trying to set up the premise that he was once a man who became an angel. Because that kind of thing where, you know, you, you have the person dying and then they put the halo and the wings on them, which, by the way, that's an abomination against God. If you, if you don't understand that, go to our website at creationliberty.com, type in the word symbol, S-Y-M-B-O-L, and that'll get you to an article called Christian Symbols Are Not Christian. The cross symbol, the Jesus fish, the halo, the wings, all that stuff are are the devil. They're not of God. Okay, They do not represent the Godhead in any way. And the Bible spells that out very clearly. Okay, I give all the scripture in there. It will show you. But even, even the, the symbol that you see a lot of times with the woman who has the wings of a stork like that, the Bible says specifically that is wickedness. But yet people use that to represent dead people in heaven. So what they do is they, they typically give the portrayal of the person dies and then they go to heaven and they get their wings and their halo. And that kind of mentality is, is pretty much what's being taught here. So I could already deduce where this was going, and I'm, I'm going to get back to that later. But at the end of the episode, what Jonathan does is he's supposedly helping this boy during his transition of dying. And so when the boy's going to die, he tells him, because this boy always talks about, well, I want to I wanna go to the moon. And he's saying this all throughout the episode. And then, so during his transition of dying, Jonathan tells him to stare at the moon until he could touch it. And again, I'm not making this up. They do this in the episode. They zoom in on the moon. And then once the boy declares that he's touched the moon, Jonathan says, quote, you're home, end quote. Now, first of all, not only does this imply that one goes to heaven without Christ, but it also implies that Jonathan's God lives on the moon, and that those who die will go to the moon as well. Now, you might say, Chris, I think you're making a stretch there. No, I'm not, because go back to part one of this teaching. Now, you remember when Michael Landon's son, Mark, said in... That when I quoted him on that, he, that, he said he believed that Michael was traveling through space and visiting other star systems as a spirit being. I mean, Michael Landon believed this stuff, and he attempted to convey his pagan thoughts and beliefs and religious dogma through the TV shows that he produced. And that's why I'm telling Christians, sanctify yourself from this stuff. Don't just, you know, put this on as a, oh, this is a family, a fun family thing to watch. I wouldn't let my family watch that. I would not let my children watch that. I mean, I don't have any children, but if I did, I wouldn't let them watch that. That's going to teach them false doctrine. Now, in episode four, Jonathan uses his so-called special powers to make a gangster's pocket knife stick so the blade wouldn't come out. Now, here's where I'm going to connect that back where he says, I was once. By the way, in the show, they never explain this in the show. Never. The premise is never set up that he was a, a guy that died and then was then came back as an angel. So he makes this gangster's pocket knife stick so the blade wouldn't come out, and then he smiles and wishes him a good day and walks past him. Then Mark Gordon, who's with him, says, quote, I guess it's easy to be cool when you've already died once, end quote. Again, why didn't they explain any of this in the show? It's like it's, like it's implied. I mean, and so that's the second piece of evidence that struck my curiosity. It seems that Jonathan Smith was an angel, or he's an angel now, but he was once a man who died and then went to heaven, or maybe he went to the moon. For all we can tell in the show, that's what, he went to the moon and then became an angel. I mean, that's what the show's teaching. The Bible does not teach that men die and become angels, nor does it teach that they go to heaven unless they repent in grief and godly sorrow of wrongdoing and have the grace of Lord Jesus Christ as their salvation. They have, to, they have to have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ paid on their accounts. And it should be noted that the judgment of God is nowhere to be found in any of Michael Landon's TV shows. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews 9.27 says, As it is appointed unto man once to die, 
but after this the judgment. So it's strange that they never ex explain the premise of Highway to Heaven from the start, okay? And so what I had to do was search through the internet. I said, forget it. I'm not going to pour through this show trying to find little tidbits here and there to piece this together. Let me go do some internet research and see if I can find the premise of this show. Surprisingly, it was difficult to find. Most shows I have no problem if I said, what is the premise of that movie? Like a movie I've never seen before. What is it, the premise of it? I can just go to a website and find it very easily. Quick paragraph that explains it. Highway to Heaven was much harder to find. I had to piece this together from multiple websites that were giving multiple pieces of information here and there. Here's the setup in a nutshell. Jonathan Smith was once a man named Arthur Thompson, who was a lawyer born in 1917 and died in 1948 leaving behind his wife and daughter. After dying of lung cancer, God decreed that he was not a very good person. So God puts Arthur on probationary duty as an angel to prove himself on earth. And I guess on top of that, transported him, you know, 40 years ahead in time so that way he could wear a full suit of, of denim jacket and denim jeans. There was a lot of denim in that show. It was just the era, I understand. But basically, he, he sent him there, well, he, now, uh, before you, you're going to be on probationary duty as an angel, and if you do a good, enough good works, Jonathan Smith, your name will now be Jonathan Smith, not Arthur, you can become a full-fledged angel. That's the premise of the show, and it's absurd. It's anti-biblical propaganda, but this is what we expect from Hollywood. Why should we expect anything different? Highway to Heaven would be Michael Landon's last production that he would ever do. Because Victor French, the man who played Mark Gordon, would die of cancer before they could produce a sixth season of the show. And so, yeah, the fact that there's five seasons of that show blows my mind. But anyway, it's, it's, I mean, it's a wonderful show for the average leavened, lukewarm, willingly blind churchgoer or Catholic or somebody. They, I'm sure they love this stuff. Michael Landon did, a lot of people don't know this, but he came up with a script for a show called Us. He was about to release a new show on top of that, but it never made it to TV because not only did Mark, did uh, excuse me, Victor French die of cancer, but then two years later, Michael Landon died of cancer also. So Landon's TV shows, and that's, that's why I wanted to get through some of these, they were filled with the intent of promoting some sort of moral goodness. That's why there's so many people that like them, because it's a feel-good show. But the feelings are not the basis on which we accept truth, okay? Michael Landon himself lived a life of sin, and he never repented for any of it. He just accepted that he was of God, as many... And man, there are so many people that are just going to be on their way to hell, that think they're of God today and are on their way to hell. Not because of their work, they didn't do enough works, don't misunderstand. It's because as much as they claim they believe on Jesus, they don't. And Jesus said, many will come to me and say in that, and say in that day, Lord, Lord, they're going to call him Lord because they believe they were of Christ. Lord, look at all these wonderful works we did in your name. Look at all this tithe that I gave. I mean, look at all, look, we cast out devils. I had a guy write me the other week, you guys saw that. I posted on that. Some guy trying to rebuke me on, on something he had no idea what he was talking about and said, I have a ministry in which I cast out devils. And yet he would, when I went and checked him out, he would go to places like Disneyland and things like that where he sensed no devils whatsoever. <laughs> you know, he's doing all this leaven stuff and he senses no devils or nothing wrong with any of it. has zero discernment, but he casts out devils. And in Matthew 7 there, Jesus said, and they're going to say unto me, you know, look at all these wonderful works I did. Look, I we cast out these devils. We did wonderful works in your name. And I will and Jesus said, I will profess unto them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. He didn't say he knew them at one time and they lost their way. He said, I never knew you. So anyway, Landon lived his life in sin. Michael Landon had multiple affairs in his lifetime. He married his first wife, Dottie Levy Frazier, in 1956 and divorced her in 1960 so he could marry Lynn No. And Lynn No was one of the people who worked with him on the uh, worked with Michael Landon on the set of Bonanza. 
If you did enough internet research, you could find pictures of her in the show. She was one of the extras. Landon then divorced Len No in 1982 so he could marry Cindy Clerico, who was a makeup artist on Little House on the Prairie. Now, I don't have to tell you that 1 plus 1 equals 2. You guys, I'm sure, are pretty good at math, okay? And so I can't... Basically, do I have to sit here and tell you that you're, you're seeing a pattern go on here? There's a bit of a pattern that's happening? Well, yeah. And so I... You know, actually, I think I want to stop there. I think we'll stop. That's a good stopping place because we're going to pick up on that next week. We're going to talk about what he was actually doing here because fornication, adultery, and the smoking, and the drinking, and the partying up lifestyle that Michael Landon lived, a lot of people don't know about. And he didn't want them to know about it because, as the Bible said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's why he tried as best he could to hide all this. But it's not only that I'm going to show you the evidence of it through different uh, media outlets, but also from his own daughter, Cheryl, who was that, that woman, Lynn No, that he married. He married Lynn No when she was seven years old. So that's his daughter, his eldest daughter, and we'll find out some more details from her own book, and we'll, we'll talk more about that next week. Anybody have any questions or comments about anything we talked about today before we close? Well, thanks for joining us, everybody, this week, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless and protect you all as you seek to study his word and glorify him in all that you say and do. And God willing, we will see you next week.